We have a treat today in our Rebranding God episode because I'm here talking to Allison, who is a intuitive therapist and we have a lot of in common. We have a lot of fun talking and sharing some thoughts about our own personal journey and the journey of a lot of our clients as we both help a lot of people to create balance in their lives, to go through transition, do inner child work. We're just passionate about helping people to grow and to evolve as we both are no. at the same time, right? <laughs> so just know that anything we share here is gonna be shared with love and compassion. Um, I'm gonna say there's some trigger warnings here because we're gonna speak some truth. And the only reason we know this truth is not that we are better than anybody, we're not more special than anyone, we just have been there ourselves. And also I can say with confidence that we learn a lot because of what we do. On each session we see with a client, we're teaching and learning at the same time because we are each other's mirrors. So I'm very excited for this conversation. Thank you for having me. So Alison, I'm gonna start right away with a big question because you see a lot of clients as well. I am curious, this is my own curiosity coming forth. What do you think is keeping people stuck the most, right? They come to do the work, they want to, you know, everybody, we can say everybody wants peace, freedom, they wanna let go of the past, whatever that goal might be, they wanna let go of anger, they want to be present, they want to relieve their stress. And yeah, we know a lot of people present a lot of resistance in this work. Yes. So yes. what do you think, you know, top of your head, just Got from it. pure intuition, what <laughs> keeps people stuck the most? Yeah, it's a great question. I feel like it's almost like the question. It's the question. Yeah. We might talk the entire podcast about <laughs> this question. Um, I think that basically it's, the, the simple version, and then I'll go into it a little more, I think is, is fear of something different, fear of change, which is even though people say they want to change, they also want security. And I think that a lot of times they want that security more. <laughs> What's familiar, and it's not, I think it's really important too that what we think. So we come into a counselor, a coach, a therapist, and we're like, yeah, I. I really want this change, right? And it's here. And then I'm like, okay, great. Now let's drop in. And when that's like a very kind of bolder spiritual terminology, right? Let's drop into our bodies. Mm -hmm. And as soon as that we do that, now we're in the nervous system. Now we're in survival patterns. And we're saying, okay, are you willing to feel what you need to feel to make these changes? Are you willing to feel and heal the nervous system patterns? And I could talk more about what that means to me, mm -hmm. but the fundamental truth that I would say is we recreate what we have survived. And that's mm -hmm. a teaching from my, one of my great teachers, Annie Brooke, and I'm sure it comes from her lineage of teachers, which is, it's, and it's beyond, it's not cognitive, it's not in our mental ability. It's mm -hmm. something, so we can say, I want to change. Mm -hmm. And now if I, I said to you, okay, well, let me ask your infant, pre-verbal, non-verbal self. Does that part of you want to do the work to change? It's going to roar at me and say, I'm terrified. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think there's a big difference between what we think and what's patterned in our nervous system. And the stuckness is a repetition, right? Mm. So old school, the old school version, Freud yeah. would say, he would call it repetition compulsion. Mm. We repeat what's familiar and yeah. we feel, and I'm going to say the safety in what's familiar, even yeah. if it's harmful. Yeah. So if I present to somebody like the example that I would give a lot of times too, is if, if I said to you, you have some unknown illness that's plaguing you and you're like, what's going on? Or I say, I can give you a diagnosis. Most people want a diagnosis. Yeah. They want the known and change. Me and getting out of stuckness means I have to be willing to feel the original wounds in order to heal. Yeah. In relationship, which honestly, it's it is I the word I use is like I think it really feels terrifying to people. 
Yeah. And we're and and for a lot of people, they're so far away from that that they come in with it's like it's like I just need to change this. Yeah. And it's like okay, well we're gonna go from the bottom up. Great answer. What <laughs> I hear you saying, in a way, for people to really take this path, they need to learn at the same time how to navigate with fear because we get very very close to fear fear letting go the patterns yes. the familiar behaviors in other words i agree with you there's such a big fear of the unknown exactly who am i without the anger who am i if i let go you know the blaming of my parents who am i in in this right it's mind-blowing because i think we all get if you walk far enough in this path and there's just to clarify, there's no, none of us are further than anyone, but for us to understand more on an intellectual level, I think as you get used to feel more and really learn about your nervous system more and know that, oh, I can feel my emotions, I'm not going to die, I'm okay. Right. They don't last, they pass. We get to a point, and this has been for me, I'm speaking from my own yeah. experience, that there's a, 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 a a part on this path that you like, you start getting excited with the unknown, actually. Yeah. You break through. So it's like for mm -hmm. anybody in this path that is like terrified of, of the unknown because you might want a certainty and stability mm -hmm. and safety in your life. And we're definitely going to talk about that. It comes to a part that kind of that boulder moves out of the way and you are in this, in this new station or new place on your journey that is like, oh my God. I can't wait to see what else you become more curious, right? Like Peter yeah. Children would say, you need to have more curiosity than fear in this, exactly. this journey. So yeah, I, I agree with you. That's, that's what the resistance shows up. And, and it's clear, even when I ask a client, it's like, if I could, if I could take this anger from you, which of course I can, but if I could, would you want to give up this anger completely? Right. And it's interesting what the answer is 99.99% of the time. Yeah. No, because mm -hmm. this anger has a function. I always help my clients to find what is the function of that. And that's right. how we name the resistance. Great. Yeah. <sighs> wow. <laughs> so, fear of the unknown. I love what you said. We recreate what we have survived, which is a great clue if we keep recreating what we have survived is a great clue that we still stuck in the same patterns. Yeah, and I mean, and I think that to be, to be kind to ourselves, to be compassionate, yeah. and like kind of develop the compassionate witness, yes. we can say, I'm, I feel like, you know, I know that we both mean it with compassion and love when we say somebody's stuck. And I also feel like, okay, this is still here, and it's still a part of me that's asking for healing. What does it need? That's right. Right? So it's like, I can just be like, oh, it, here I am in the same relationship pattern. Oh my God, I can't believe it's here again. And then that's a place, even there, this, that goes into some of the other things, right? Which is, I could go into shame. Yeah. Now, if I go into shame or judgment, or if I'm like, God, I'm stuck again, right? And I take out my, my I will say this about myself, I take out my whip, yeah. the shame whip. Yeah. Now I'm actually in more of the pattern. Yeah. So there's a place there that I can interrupt the pattern too and say, I'm not going to shame myself. I'm going to say, you know what? Here's another opportunity. My, my mom would say another effing opportunity yeah. to practice, to say I'm being given another chance to have healing here. You know, it's like I'm going around the spiral again. It's the same, but different. Yeah, you know? that's a great point. It's, you use the, the word spiral, and that's how I explain to clients. And I've been there myself, beating myself up by saying, I can't believe I'm in this again. And it's not again in a way, it's not the exact same point right. because it's not like you go in circles. To me, you know, we go into a spiral and if you visualize a spiral going up, it feels like you're in the same place, but you're not. It's like going up a mountain. It might feel the exact same view. Mm -hmm. might feel like you're seeing the same trees, the same landscape, and yet you higher up in that mountain. You might take a fall a little bit right. sometimes, but the spiral is still moving. So if we're really gonna talk about stuckness, mm -hmm. we, we, we never really stuck. It sometimes just feels like energy. Energy is always moving. And sometimes it was like those eddies mm -hmm. on the river that the, yeah. you know, the water's moving in kind of in the same place and kayakers get stuck yeah. there until they get out of there. 
but we never really stuck and life the beauty of this mm -hmm. It's that life is constantly showing us where we need to heal. And if we're really stuck, right? If we're really stuck, it's because we're actively keeping ourselves there. Oh, let's go there. Because <laughs> this leads to a big conversation. Again, trigger warnings here. And we're going to speak of the victimhood archetype. The right. victim. Right. We're not here calling anybody a victim because let me say right away that I call myself in that place of being a victim, complaining about money, how expensive and the system in Boulder, how right. it is. I was caught in a victimhood myself just a few months ago. And I know what happens when we name it and we start taking action. Action. Right. And we can, you know, I can share more of the experience. But let's talk about this pattern, which I think, you know, if we're going back to the, the first question, what keeps people stuck or just slowing their own process of healing and evolution, I would say it's being a victim. Yeah. Let's and talk I, about that. And I, I, this is the trigger warning part, but I would say, you know, when, if I go back to what keeps people stuck, I feel like you do, you do that. You're, you're choosing. Yes. And, and I, and I could feel like my own, like kind of belly rising up here because I'm like, I've done it. I've done it countless times, which is like, and then and I get angry if somebody reflects that back to me. Why are you choosing this? I'm like, no, no, it's just I'm sad or I'm You're depressed or, and I and it's also sort of like, you know, I know there are no good words for this, but it's a habit. Mm -hmm. It's an addiction. Yeah. It's like there's chemistry involved with being in victim mode. You know, the drama of life, like. What would happen? I mean, my, my good friend and also somebody who I have written a book with, Donna Morgan, we would just be like, well, are you, what would happen if you didn't have drama? Like, what would happen? Like, and people are like, she just told me this story. It's like, people would be like, oh my God, I don't, I don't even know. Yeah. You know, so there's an, there's an attachment to it. Mm -hmm. And, and I think as we're like maturing in our evolution as humans and on our path, there is a place of really taking ownership and responsibility for what, how you are choosing to look at your life, to look at life, to look, to look at relationships, and to also watch the places. Like it's almost like I think of it as like the neural pathway. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, that's a really well-worn pathway. And I'm like, I'm gonna shoot down that pathway because it's open. Versus, you know, there's a place in our, in our brain where it's like, there's another choice, but it doesn't look obvious. And so we can just sit there and, yeah. and wait, you know? Yeah, it, it, it creates drama. And I was thinking about drama. Let me make sure this is not, oh, this is soft enough. Okay. Um, the, I was thinking about the drama the other day. You're absolutely right. Because I caught myself a few times in the last two years plus that being devoted to a lot of inner work. There are times that I didn't have any drama, that I had free time, I didn't have even stress. I caught this part of my brain, on my mind, almost like there's something wrong with you because it should, you should, you should be some, some, you should be stressed out about money. You should, it's almost mm -hmm. like this, this aspect of myself, and I think it's, of course it's not of us, that wants to create drama, mm -hmm. that yeah. wants to, to create a, a place to focus on because it's like this defensive mechanism. Mm. If we find something outside of us to put our focus on, then I don't need to look what's happening inside me. And I think that's part of the addiction of being a victim, which of course is unconscious. Nobody's waking up and say, I'm going to be a victim today. No, it's unconscious. That's why we call it an archetype. It's it's a, it's a it's a love of consciousness, or unconsciousness that, you know, when you do the work, you bring that part with a lot of love and compassion to your conscious mind, and then you can work with that, with that aspect. Yeah, and I feel like in our like what you're saying feels like so important, and also, I think that this culture. Hmm. You know, without being too conspiratorial, yeah, I think that there's a there's a piece of wanting yes. people 
we're, we're great consumers mm -hmm. as victims yes. of everything. Self-help, books, diets, clothing. Like, you need to change something. You're not okay. Like, there's... And somebody's going to come and save me. That's right. Yeah. You know, and, and again, that's like a really big thing. And then I think we have it on multiple levels. We have it in our families. Yeah. We have... There's, there's truth also. I just want to also hold the, the place of just to be respectful of what people have been through. Like we have, there are places where we're victimized in yes, our life, right? 100%. Like they're truly, I don't necessarily think that that makes anyone a victim, but we, there are traumas that we experience. Yes. There are wounds, there are things, crises that happen in our lives and that's real. And I think it's still always like, yes, that happened really being with the truth of it and then moving on in your life. I love the distinction. You Many of us, and maybe somebody right now listening to this, is being victimized, but that doesn't imply you need to become a victim. Because exactly. once you recognize that you're being victimized by maybe being in an abusive relationship, maybe being lied to, maybe being with a, you know, <laughs> a diagnosed narcissist, and we're going to talk about this next. So you being in a way victimized, and doesn't mean you have to become a victim of right. your story. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's big. So since, uh, you know, uh, you and I had a great chat the other day when we were talking about this trend that we're watching happening in the therapeutic world, in the coaching world, and like anything has, pol everything has polarities, everything has the light, everything has the darkness. And we were chatting about this trend that, this this narcissism thing in a way became a field itself in the personal growth mm -hmm. and spiritual development industry where I can literally see some coaches running with this material and want to amplify in a way to get clients because if they're gonna find you know they go after the the, the people who are saying they're victims of narcissism, you know, being yeah. in narcissistic relationships. And you and I are observe, observing this trend as like, it's almost like they are perpetuating or amplifying exactly. victimhood. Exactly. And now in leave, it's creating these dynamics in relationships where people are looking at relationships from those lenses constantly. So, you know, how can you have a, a difficult conversation approach? I mean, it's creating, I think it's creating a lot of unnecessary drama. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and then, it, then it's like people are coming into healers with that framework, with that language, yeah, and and seeing their own lives in that way. And it's like, so what would you have said ten years ago right. or twenty years ago without like, the language. without the language exactly? And what would your healing look like? That's a great point. Or what would your relationships look like? And I think that also goes into no pun intended feeds into all the social media that we were talking about and what we're looking at and being, I think there's, we know, everyone will talk about, right, the algorithm and what we're being shown and our phone, you know, things are being sent to us. Yeah. And I think there's a level of awareness of how that's affecting how we perceive our own lives and how we perceive, like, I feel like, again, how we perceive what it means, what it means to be victim and honestly, even what it means to be empowered in relationship. I think there's danger in that too. Like I've had people tell me like, well, I'm not the divine masculine. Mm -hmm. I'm not the divine feminine. I'm not like, it's like the polarity in both mm -hmm. directions mm -hmm. is, is not something that's, it's not real necessarily. No, it's a program. <laughs> well, and it has creating also this, this imbalance. Like you made a great point how this, all this conversation about empowerment, you know, can also go to that dark side because some people are like, well, I'm going to set very strong boundaries because I'm in power in times that actually setting those strong boundaries might not be appropriate mm -hmm. because that time is appropriate for you to have an open heart, vulnerable conversation with your partner. And yeah. it's not time to set a boundary. And exactly. so people are confusing boundaries in times that actually stay here, stay open because this conversation matters. This conversation is going to help us to actually... Yeah get closer, get more intimate. So there's almost like this, 
aggressive mm. boundary setting that is now allowing for people to even, you know, get to the deep places where we can heal together. Totally. I feel like it's where, I don't have the answer to this question, but it's like, I think I hear the question of, where am I getting information that's useful, that's serving yeah. my healing? And where am I getting information that's actually like, not realistic about what it means to be human and in relationship. Like, I mean, it's almost like we're being given some parameters or I don't know, I don't want to say rules, but there, there are these, you know, archetypes or I mean, the, the, the old archetypes, I feel like in history and mythology are where I would go and say, oh yeah, let's look there. But now what's happening is we're creating these, I don't know, warped, maybe modernized, things and I think it actually just to go back to victim and all this energy and the drama triangle I would say yeah right because the drama triangle is victim and I know this might not be the politically correct way but it's the way I learned it is victim perpetrator rescuer yes and as so as as soon as you read or you're on your social media and you get a bunch of things that are about any of those you're playing into something that is not relationship yeah so if you're the victim you're not in relationship. If you're the aggressor, the perpetrator, not in relationship. The healer slash rescuer, not relationship. I was, I was that one. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I'm just saying some of these things actually prevent us yeah. from being in relationship in a real way. We're not. We're we're in some kind of, you know, dynamic, a power dynamic. Yeah, we are, and it's interesting because again it's just like technology all these books these courses this you know many teachers teaching us giving us the language about relationships yeah. like attachment styles or uh -huh. or um, other frameworks like Terence real you know share yeah. some other frameworks and give all this intellectual material let's just summarize we are we're we have been given a lot of language through intellectual material and learn how to label and how to understand the dynamics of relationships we have. But I mm. think the aspect that all this intellectual material is not serving us is that we, we kind of intellectualizing everything more than we always have. Yeah. And instead of truly being present with each other in our hearts mm -hmm. and reconnect with our intuition. Yeah. Just like I think this has happened, and you can tell because you're a parent, this has happened with parenting as well. Years ago, I don't know, maybe in the 70s, the 80s, we had all these books about how to parent properly, and it yeah. was great. Right. At the same time, made a lot of mothers disconnect from the intuition right. and putting their babies in the crib and let their babies cry to sleep because the books were teaching that versus using their intuition that says, okay. I gotta grab my baby because my baby needs to feel safe. So it cut off That's even right. more the intuitive yeah, I trust you us. more than I trust myself. That's right. So a lot of couples are getting these dynamics now and I have done myself that, oh, let me recite what I read in this book about attachment style, whatever that is, or talk about the, the triangle, the victim triangle thing, instead of like, let me really listen to my partner now in my heart instead. And I think it, that's the gap. That's what we're missing. Right we now. are. Big yeah. Time. And that, that feels also like part of what, if you approach somebody and you start kind of doing anything where you're like, are you willing, you know, the language again would be right, like to like drop in. Are you willing yes. to feel your heart, your gut? You know, a lot of people in this culture, and I, I feel like I've been there, are from here up. The That's neck it. Up. Yeah. The neck up. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Just thoughts. Right. And the healing <sighs> that we need for the wounds, the traumas, the things that have happened in our lives, our relationships, the only way that you heal those traumas is in relationship with somebody else. Any wound that's been created in relationship, to me, ultimately, it's not that we can't do any healing on our own, yeah. but if the wound was created in, and I say in relationship, meaning like even in a relationship that 
was unhealthy yeah. or where a need wasn't met or where mom was anxious, depressed, or dad was drinking or whatever it is, if it happened in relationship, it needs to heal yeah. in relationship. Yeah. And what we're talking about is, to me, it's some version of, and I'm going to say this, it's some version of spiritual bypassing. Yeah. And meaning like, you know, I'm going to know in my intellect the right thing to say, read the right books, do the right practices, and I am honestly be full of it until you're willing to actually feel it in your body, mm. in your heart, in your gut, in your tissues. Feel it. But I feel like there's, it's in a way, there's a place where all the information can actually inhibit us. Yep block us from and it looks like and this is a big place actually for me it looks like somebody who knows it looks like somebody who's done quote unquote the work but they know it there's a big difference between knowing it and living it or doing it and the level of vulnerability that we have to feel and i mean i would say that for myself i'm like sometimes i'm like i don't know <laughs> You know, but I think almost anything can be used for healing or can be another version of what I have learned to be, you know, is spiritual bypassing or intellectual bypassing or, you know, cognitive bypassing. Yeah. I know here in my head, but nowhere else. Yeah. I think that it's a great place to, to, segue to the word we use as a theme of our conversation, which was balance. Mm -hmm. Creating this balance, which I think in this case, what I'm hearing balance as get educated. We're not here to say don't read the books. I love reading, <laughs> but I'm just also, you know, like you expressed earlier, be aware of what you're feeding yourself with. Mm -hmm. Don't feed yourself with things that are just going to validate your stories. Like, like, for example, start just reading every single book about narcissism out there because that is going to just, again, amplify your view and you're going to see everything from those totally. lenses and might be feeding the victim in you. So the balance of what I hear in this conversation is about educate yourself, learn, mm -hmm. but ultimately put all the books away, put everything that you know away and feel your feelings mm -hmm. and just I would say just by us learning how to do that in our own bodies alone or in the presence of a teacher or therapist like our clients do with us like I do in my own teacher I do in my own practice every morning you need to master that and then you able to start doing that in the presence of another person being in your body where you put all those books away and what are you really feeling Right. in the field and, and it's a lot of times it's not going to be appropriate to mention what you learned in that book you know no. <laughs> no it makes me think of like one of the right like the i don't know if, what if he calls himself he was like one of the fathers of you know psychology right carl jung would mm -hmm. say learn every technique learn everything learn it all and then when you sit down with somebody forget it let it go yeah, forget just it all. be there yes be present. And I think that there are these terms, again, that we say, like, in terms of balance or, like, be present. And I actually feel like I'm not sure that we all know what that means. Yeah. We know we know cognitively what it means. But do we know how to do it? And I, I feel like the answer for most of us is no. And I think, at least I would say for me, that has been my practice right now with friends, with anyone, with in. Again, we have an advantage to practice this with clients. Right. Because if we don't drop in as mm -hmm. coaches and therapists, if we don't fully drop in in the present with our clients, we're actually not able to help from the place of intuition. Exactly. So I would say you and I have an advantage that we <laughs> get to practice this over and over with clients. Doesn't mean we have master in every session or that I have master with people outside my work. I, I would say get caught many times out of my body and I wanna, I'm going to bring but you something know. intellectual. But I know that time like, ooh, <laughs> I am not in my body. I am in my, my mind. I am in my head. And I being an intellect, intellectual for many, many right. years. And now right. I'm like... Well, that's the benefit of our... That's to me, again, the balance of 
I would say, I sometimes would just say gut, heart, and mind, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. or, and you know, we could say psychology, developmental psychology, how I grew up, what happened in my family versus the divine and my spiritual practices, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's like our mind is amazing in that way of being able to say, oh, look, I just left. I wasn't present. Yes. That's beautiful. That's the purpose, right? We can learn something. We can be a witness. We can gather information. We can integrate with it. But I, and if it's out of balance, then our healing doesn't happen. That's you know, right. I, I, I always think to myself, right? I got to Boulder, Colorado from New York City. Mm -hmm. I grew up and I was like, everyone's just a walking mind. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Yeah. That's normal. And I, I feel like, you know, and I'm using New York, but it's like, that's just the way people were operating. And I went to become a student at Naropa mm -hmm. here in Boulder. And I didn't, I didn't even understand when people were, there was a criticism or a negativity coming towards me because I was in my head. And I didn't even understand mm -hmm. because I had no context yeah. for anything else. That was my life. That was my family. That was where I grew up. That's how everyone was or is. Yep. And we need to be gentle with ourselves. And I think, you know, one thing I constantly work on myself and help clients with is to, to find a bridge. We can't just go straight from our head to our bodies. Yeah. And I think that's the art of coaching and, and then doing therapy, guiding clients is to find a, a method, find a way that help them to create this bridge between the head and the body and right. sometimes it takes me a full year or even two years with a client to get that client to finally start feeling the body because there's such a resistance there to feel because there's fear yeah of feeling yeah and what you're saying i feel like the the work we say it's like are work. you willing to do the work right and Which so again people are bridge. like what does that mean it's not in your head <laughs> so which brings this point going back to the first question in our in, in this podcast what keeps people stuck <laughs> a lot of people I want to bring this because I think it can help a lot of our listeners a lot of people come to therapy or or transformational coaching like I do seeking for a, an intellectual method to solve their problems Mm -hmm. And I literally, I know I had clients walking away from this practice with me because it got to a point they really, they got frustrated because they wanted me to give them an intellectual framework to, to heal their pain. Right. And I, I couldn't give that because no. it is, it is an intellectual. So let's just talk a little bit about that. Uh, so especially yeah. for those, and we say there's a lot of compassion, those of you who are still chasing that therapist or that coach that's going to give you that formula, that ABC formula to heal. It doesn't exist. And I'm going to say this, if there's anybody that promised you that they're going to heal you in this three month program, if you sign up, run away because <laughs> it, I want to do an entire podcast. We're just talking about how this path, whew, this path of growth is not easy. There is no formula. And it's such an art and even hard to explain through a podcast, but it's like, I see we're talking about the trends that we're watching and I see so many people talking about nervous system regulation now, or even inner child healing yeah. and they selling packages as is this thing that, oh, I broke the code and I'm going to help you to really heal your inner child in three months. Mm -hmm. That yeah. is not possible. Right. And I mean, and the truth is, I think it could happen and it could happen in an instant, in an instant. So let's talk about that. Yeah. I mean, that's I, a paradox. It is. But it's and, true. And I think it's, it is something like an awakening or, you know, the, another word that's getting thrown around a lot now, right? Is quantum or and medicine do, journeys. Yeah, yeah. But we can wake up. In a second. In a second. Yes. And it doesn't cost $10,000 in 2003 <laughs> months or whatever. It doesn't. And, I'm, and it could, I mean, and the truth is, it might happen for some people that way. Yes. Because they decided, because they were willing to do something. It, And, you know, and maybe it is the relationship in that moment. Maybe. Right? 
but it's like, and I think that's amazing, but I feel like promising that as, as if I can offer you a fix from the outside is like where I, when you say run, run, it's like that does that piece of like, if I said to you, are you willing to feel what you would need to feel inside yourself in an instant, in three months, in three years so that you can heal? Yeah. Yeah, and it's true. I do have with certain clients a tremendous experience, maybe in one session where there's a lot of release happening. Yeah. And, you know, of course, the miracles, we'll call them a miracle. The moment there's a shift of perception That's it. that the person is willing to release that, that baggage, the emotion, the story, whatever that is, that, that, that emotion trapped in the body. Exactly. That's a moment of miracle. And even then, you know, it's going to involve something called integration. Yeah. So a lot of times, even if you, somebody who had the experience through, you know, breath work, deep meditation, you walked El Camino, you know, <laughs> or you did a plant medicine journey and you had this incredible revelation, translating all those spiritual experiences into this 3D world is still something that requires work right exactly so either way is going to require the work because at least in my own experience i i use medicine i work with mdma i work myself with psilocybin mdma is more my preference that i use i have incredible spiritual experiences but the work really begins after the medicine journey because i have this incredible you know i i can feel in my physiology the change that i'm like oh i know what self-love it feels like i know I release a lot. I release my guilt in that medicine journey, and yet, what is it like to walk every single day now without that baggage? That involves work. Yes, and I'm like, I'm trying to think of like, there's a part of me that's searching because I know that people hear the word work, mm -hmm. and it sets off all kinds of negative yeah. associations. It's no different. Somebody wants to get fit, right? Or like, do you want to improve the quality of your life? Do you want to be happier? Do you want to feel more peaceful? That's right. Like that's the work. Yeah, I, I was yeah. a personal trainer. Or do you want to keep suffering? That's right. <laughs> I was a personal trainer for 25 years and I still help some, some clients here and there. And it's no different. If somebody wants to heal their low back pain or somebody wants to lose 30 pounds, they're going to need to do the work. Right. And I, what I was going to say to you to go back to the victim when you're saying oh, that is, yeah. I think this culture teaches this culture. I mean, and I... Western, and we are part of the culture. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, you know... Western, yes. westernized civilization has taught us, and especially now in this time in history, has taught us and trained us to outsource our healing. That's right. It's, I'm going to go to somebody and they're going to tell me what to do and they're going to fix this for me. Yeah. That's not doing your work. No. You know? And I, that doesn't mean that we don't need guides. We've always had guides. Always. Throughout history, our elders, our mm -hmm. ancestors. Mm -hmm. We don't have that, right? And I feel, I feel actually feel a lot of grief when I'm saying that. Yeah. Like I, I get the impulse to reach for support and for guidance. That's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Do that. I take somebody's hand. Like I always say to people, I'll walk through the fire with you. I'll sit in the fire with you. Yeah. But you still have to go. Yeah. <laughs> We're, we're both going, you know, and that to me, again, is the work of the vulnerability of being in relationship fully with yourself and with somebody else. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, again, I point this out to in, in a lot of my, my podcasts about the importance, especially if you dealing with a lot of trauma, doing a lot of deep work with the inner child that is important to work with a guide that can hold your hand with a lot of love and compassion, fierce compassion though, somebody yeah. that's also going to lead you to your truth. And it's crucial. I wouldn't be where I am without an incredible right. teacher. Exactly. So, ooh, let's, <laughs> let's shift here a little bit into more spirituality. Although everything we talked so far, it's, is spiritual work as well. You we can is. separate. <laughs> if you're healing and you're just treating this as pure psychological work without the spiritual part, you're going to be missing a huge aspect of this. So healing is psychology, is spirituality, is physiology, right. it's all. 
Let's shift into the spirituality. So I want to ask you, what is, when you do your work, your experience, what is, how do you connect with the divine? Like, what, what does that look like for you? Oh, my God. I mean, and the it, number one thing, I mean, that's just like my heart is being in nature. Yeah. Like, just, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm teased sometimes about it because I walk and if I'm walking and I'm outside, I'm like, that's the medicine. Yeah. That's it. That's yeah. a cure. You know, it's a cure for everything. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of everything. I just hear the sounds. I look around. And I mean, and there are a lot of other practices I do. But if all of them were taken away and I had one left, that would be the one that I need. Yeah. And that would be the one that I choose. Because it's just a reminder, a fundamental reminder to me of what it means to be alive. Amazing. So yeah. now I... I want to like, how do you bring that energy of nature? Because I also, I have met a lot of people that give me the exact same answer. They are nature. And yet they feel with anxiety. They cannot sit still. And mm -hmm. the reason they're drawn to nature, of course, because when they're nature, that volume of anxiety, right? That, that, that noisy mind turns it down. Right. So how would you say, how can you use the teachings of mother nature how do you bring that to your couch, to your cushion, when you're doing your practice? When How do you use that to connect with the divine in you? How like you've been talking about dropping in. So let's, right. I'm, I'm trying to build a little bridge here yeah. between what you get in nature to actually do the work in your body in a way that helps you to heal. Yeah, and I think it's actually a great place to talk also about the intellect mm -hmm. and also like the embodiment yeah. of, I definitely think to myself, I think when I'm out in nature and I bring it back with me, which is I'm not any different than this. I'm a part of this. This is me. I am that, right? And remembering that will affect every part of my day. And of course I forget every day mm -hmm. <laughs> and I need to be reminded every day. Yeah. And the other thing that I feel like has, that I was shy about for a long time and after I developed a really strong friendship and, you know, working relationship with my friend Donna, mm -hmm. we talk a lot about signs, synchronicities mm -hmm. and serendipity. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that, you know, an example would be seeing animals mm -hmm. out, out, outside, yeah. right? So it's like I, I have part of the way I bridge it is I see something and I choose and I believe and I make meaning of everything. So, so the word that comes to mind is intention. When you go to nature, you set an intention to use the time in nature as your spiritual practice. Yes. There's an intention. There's, there. an, there's an intention. Yeah. There's an intention and a natural kind of just, it's just me. Yeah. I'm inspired. Yeah. Right? And so when I see the red fox run in front of me. I'm like, Ooh, red fox, and I get really excited. And then I come home, and you know, it, it, there's still a part of me that's always a little feels a little silly. But I come home and I look it up. <laughs> I look up red fox totem. Now, you know, I'm a New Yorker, and I, I say this because there's that's the this is the bridge. The intellectual part of me is like, oh, that's funny, Allison. You know, you, you're looking that up. That's so cute. So cute. Oh, you, you believe in magic, and I do. Yes. And it makes my life better. And it, and I and those signs and all that meaning never fail me. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I could bring right back into my life and my day. Yeah. Right. Like so, I'm trying to think of an example. I mean, it comes up with clients, but it's like I might talk about that red fox in a session with somebody because they're telling me about some clever, tricky mm. partner, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm, I'm going to bring it right back into this moment along with psychology, along with what happened in your family. Let's not forget yeah. the magic and, you know, having faith or trust or connection to something greater, because I think that there's a fundamental place in this reality again, where we're being cut off from that. And it it's kind of reminds me, to me, it's like intuition is that. Intuition is when I am connected to my intuition, I'm connected to the divine. That's what it is. Beautiful. I'm getting direct messages all the time. Am I listening? Yeah. And then I would say also, sometimes I hear, but I don't do what it says. So 
So that's another place too where I like I will hear a message and I'm like I gotta turn the volume way down on a lot of other things in my life in order to hear that and make meaning and then take action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that you bring the magic and intuition because to me as you're describing nature it would be like the first step if anybody is feeling just super stressed with life and you want to start reconnect with your intuition get out in nature. That's it. Find the magic find the magic in nature and the, if you if you don't know where magic is i would say go to nature go find right. a hike go walk by right. see by a river and you start looking around and it's impossible not to find the magic everywhere yeah. and that can be we're speaking of bridge i think it can not can it is a powerful bridge back to the body and back to intuition and where you turn the volume of everything down and you just with nature because we are nature. That's right. And you know what? Once you know that and you remember that, you're not going to be a victim anymore. Yeah. I'm just saying, no. You can't. Like, you remember. When you're forgetful, which we all have, and we're trained to outsource, buy something, pay someone, you're going to be much more prone to being a victim. When you reconnect and you remember, and I mean, I could forget and remember over and over sure. again, but I'm not... I don't, what do I need? That's right. I don't, I don't need that. I mean, this the is, medicine is there. <laughs> this is a, such a journey of remembering. And sometimes I, I, I have moments in my own practice or in nature that as I start reconnecting with this div, divine in me, the, the, you can call Christ consciousness, divinity, God, source energy, or simply call intuition. I have moments that I, I, I cry when I realize I am remembering who I am. So the journey of healing is really a journey of returning. It is. Returning to our essence, to our hearts. Yeah. And that's why I read something today that, you know, in this personal growth path and journey of healing is also a, a journey of loss, a lot of loss we say a drone of death as well because we losing all this structures this mm -hmm. this beliefs that we adopt for so long that we start losing anything that is not who we are yeah right. whatever whoever you are not count on it that you're going to lose in this path and and i think it's important in a, in a future podcast for us to talk about how that process can be very painful as well yeah and process of loss but you're not losing i want to emphasize here you're only losing what it's not you you're only mm -hmm. losing what doesn't belong to your truth self yes it's true but we're pretty attached to we're things. pretty attached <laughs> so that therefore we we use expressions in this journey as as a process of birth and death mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and there's and, a lot of death. Yeah, and again, the stuckness mm. feels to me like sometimes like, well, I'm going to die yeah. if I feel this. Mm -hmm. It's going to annihilate me. And you know what? There's, there might be some truth to that. Yeah. It's going to annihilate everything that you think is you. That's right. That's not, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. Sounds, that sounds scary? It's, I think it is. And I would say if you're on the healing path and you haven't felt uncomfortable, <laughs> or felt like you might be... Some part of you might be dying. You're probably not really doing it. <laughs> you're probably not in your body. Let's say you, 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 you might be doing the work. And for a lot of people, the beginning of this work is to the intellectual mind. And if yeah, you're still in that exactly. stage of learning about psychology, totally. learning about how your brain works, I would say, yes, start there. Totally. And at some point, everyone is going to have to choose to get deep into the body, into the emotional body, and feel those emotions. And it could be, like we said, and there's always the possibility of quantum a moment. Let's talk quantum. <laughs> Energy and frequency. Yes. Yeah. The most powerful language for transformation and manifestation. And I just wrote a book, it's not published yet, that I say energy is the loudest voice in the room. Mm. And I'm finding, I'm very excited about these times because I, I find that we have more information we have more intellectual material we can say because 
the science is sharing more about quantum physics, and I love that, that we know more and more that as we change our energy, or you know, the, the, the language of energy, it's vibration frequency, everything in our world it starts to change. Everybody might still be behaving exactly the same way, your bank account might be exactly the same, everything the same, but there's something completely different in you, I definitely feel this in myself. So let's, how can we make this in a very easy way for people to understand quantum? <laughs> Good luck, go. Um, <laughs> every, everything, like I'm gonna say this, the science version. Yeah. Every single thing in, in the universe is vibrating. Yep. Everything is, has this energy and we believe or we perceive them as separate mm -hmm. and they're not at all separate. And, you know, people will talk about the butterfly effect or, you know, if something happens on one side of the world, the birds figure out how to open the milk containers that are sitting outside. And then, you know, on the other side of the world on the same day at the same time, the birds have also figured that out. Well, what is that? Mm -hmm. You know, they think they call it, one of the teachers called it the morphogenic field, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, what is that? That's there's there's an awareness, there's a reality, there's an energy, of and it's it's also to me it's wholeness. It's the universal mind. It's that everything is vibrating and everything is affecting the vibration of everything else. Yeah, beautiful. At the smallest level and at very large, the micro and the macro. <laughs> I love it. Now we're gonna bring here to this 3D practical life. Good luck. <laughs> you were talking earlier about algorithm, right? How like, if you are on Instagram, for example, or Facebook, and you click like in certain posts, and then at the same time you're in your Google search mm. or AI or chat, GPT, whatever these platforms are, and you start searching quantum physics, let's say, yeah. right? Just because you're interested in that. And you start all of a sudden seeing in your feed everything about quantum physics and teachers talk about quantum physics, courses being sold in quantum physics. So you're gonna get bombarded with this material in your feed because that's where your attention is going to. Yes. Great, go for it, learn quantum physics. But let's talk about the polarity of that. Not the quantum, you know, if you study all quantum physics, that can have a polarity as well. But let's talk about the people who are back to the victimhood, right? They looking at posts mm -hmm. about being a victim or this kind of quote unquote empowerment things. So so we are algorithm ourselves. Yes. Well so yeah. Go there. So yeah, so I when you're talking, what's standing out to me as I'm listening to you, which is interesting. And it's, you know, it's something, again, that we started talking about and I think about a lot, which is there is an algorithm that is a computer, yeah. right? That's, gener that's collecting data mm -hmm. and sending you more of the same. More okay? of the same, yeah. Now, that's, that sounds like, and this is, again, it sounds like science, right? It's a computer. It's mm -hmm. a program, which is important. And I think that, and I don't, this is just how I'm thinking about it right now, but there's a layer of, and I'm, I'm creating a vibration. I'm mm -hmm. creating a frequency. So yes, there's a computer or my phone or the algorithm that's saying, you're looking at this, maybe we can sell you this product. Yes. Or this, so we're just gonna keep sending you more, right? But every time you make a choice like that, it's there's the science, 3D reality of what you're bringing in and you're calling in from a computer program, zeros and ones. They're sending, they're gonna fire you more of the same. Now I think there's also what's happening in your being and as a result of what you're looking at, what else are you attracting into your life? Mm -hmm. So it's, yes, there's, the, there's Instagram and Facebook and you know the reels and all these things and it's sending you things. And then how is that affecting who you're gonna meet when you walk up down the street? or how you're gonna interact in a relationship, or what is, in, a, in a, the quantum world, what is the frequency, what is the vibration, what are you energetically offering 
as a result of the choices that you made and then some computer generated system that also is making choices now for you. Right. <laughs> like I even think of a, a typical situation. Let's say you, you, you and your iPhone or in your computer and you receiving all this feeding and you're not aware of your energy and all of a sudden you step out of your house and you go see friends or you just walking and seeing strangers. What is the frequency? What's the vibration that you're carrying after you were exposed to all that feeling? Right. What right. are you bringing out into the world? Because everything is connected. Yeah, exactly. And also the recognition. I think the really important thing is I think that we're forgetful, that we're feeding, we are feeding the system and then it's feeding us more of the same. That's right. And it's creating a certain state of being that we then carry out into the world. And it's like, so I would say we should be more aware when we're interacting in all of these different technological systems besides just in our lives and our relationships. If I look this up, do I understand? It's almost like, I almost hear like a marriage proposal or like a contract each time. I'm typing this into Google. Do I understand that as I do this, that I'm inviting more of this energy into my life? Yeah. I am. Yeah. On, in those systems and in my life. That's right. Because I'm... There's no separation. Right. Nothing is separated. And I think that's an important concept to, that we're trying to get across here. Nothing is separated. No. So... Yeah. This is good news and bad news because the good news is then what would happen if you surround yourself with positive feeding? And I'm not talking just silly positive psychology here and deny that anything bad is happening in the world. But at the same time, it's like what are you watching? And a typical example is this. People who start first thing in the morning watching the news. What happens with, the, with your body, with your brain? And I was just coaching a client hmm. this yesterday that he literally said, I'm addicted to the news in the morning. And I'm like, how do you feel when you're doing that? So start asking yourself, when you watch the news in the morning, and this is not any criticism, but just check in. What is your energy? What are you feeling? And what is the energy that you're going to bring into your entire day? I mean, right. we had... By now, talking about morning routines is almost like old school conversation. Right. We have books written about the importance of morning routines because it's the same thing. How yeah. you start your morning, is how, it's the energy that you're going to carry through your day. So this is not new no. conversation at all. But now, like you said, we expose with all this information, even more with the, with the rise of AI and... AI to me is not good or bad. It's just technology and depends how you're going to use that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how, what is it doing to your frequency? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm, I think the word discernment is, mm -hmm. a, is a word that I'm applying a lot in my life right now, even in, in innocent Instagram posts. Like, what this post, how do I feel when I watch this post? And there's a lot of unfollowing right now happening for me mm -hmm. because, like, this doesn't doesn't rise my vibration and this is not about only high vibes thing but we have a choice to make it every second exactly and that's a lot that's it overwhelming is. it is overwhelming and there's so much information and so much like energy coming our way all the time yeah and i you know to keep looping it back right it's like being addicted potentially to the news is the beginning of feeling victimized like you're it's the drama it's the drama it's the you know head turning when there's an accident yeah so that's what you're setting yourself up for and you're inviting that yeah. experience into your life yeah and i'm not saying be oblivious no, or be ignorant all. of what's happening in the world but it's like how do you do that in a way that's balanced where is how do you know where is the, and I mean, and that's again about a practice of embodiment and yeah. knowing like intellect, heart, gut, like that's enough. I've eaten enough. I'm full. I don't eat anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I, <clears throat> an example, I can't forget it happened like a couple weeks ago. I was in this beautiful hike at Chautauqua mm -hmm. and I made a little video of this hike and I sent to my mother and 
with all respect, my mother and my stepfather have the TV on all day long, mm -hmm. news playing in the background all day long. And by the way, even if you have something to play in the background, it's still affecting your field. It's huge. Okay. So I shared this with my mother about this nature, how green boulder is, and her response was, well, you better enjoy this because everything is being destroyed. And that to me was a moment like, wow, okay, yeah, there's some truth on our, our, our planet, you know, a lot of parts of our planet are being destroyed and it's sad, it's devastating. And yet I send a video and instead of looking as, wow, what a beautiful day my daughter is having, her brain, and this is not even free will, she didn't have a choice at that moment because it was an automatic reaction to see the loss instead of seeing the beauty of that. Exactly. But that's because her brain is being programmed every day. She's being, in a way, a victim of the news, of the programming exactly. every day. And, and she looks at the world, especially nature, from the lenses of loss and destruction. Yeah. And that's when a lot of people can have a whole conversation about free will, but that's what I believe most people are not in their free will because they are in a way they they are hypnotized they're in a trance mm -hmm. and there's this automatic reactions or automatic responses of like they just see the world through in a way very dark lenses exactly and, and I that doesn't help no or humanity no and i mean i even think of that i just thought of i flashed on the language that we use you know if you want to do a certain kind of search it says that you might want to change the filters for like different things. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, there's a filter all the time. Yeah. We always have filters. Yeah. You know, it's just that are we aware that they're what it is? Yeah. Are we choosing it? Yeah. Are we, what would happen if that went away? Yeah. It's just some, it's the word you use, discernment. Discernment. Mm -hmm. Now, this sounds like exhausting that we have to be aware all the time or vision all the time. And I want to say you don't. Just be aware when all of a sudden that you feel a lot of contraction in your body right. or you are feeling good and all of a sudden you're feeling bad. Like your, your emotions are always an indicator, as Esther Hicks would say. Exactly. They're an indicator that something is something's off. So you don't have to be like, vigilant because then you're going to just amplify your anxiety. <laughs> you know, a lot of people are already living yeah. anxiety, but you will know because your, our bodies are constantly telling us that something is off. And yes. if we pay attention to our bodies, we know how to recalibrate ourselves. That's part of the work though. Knowing, being able to hear what's happening in my body. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people have come to therapy and said, I don't know what you're talking about takes yeah, training exactly. just like anything exactly. if you want to learn a new sport you would start from the fundamentals it, it needs yep it's you need you need to have the desire to do this work and you mm -hmm. need to make a decision that you want to live in freedom and in peace so i want to wrap it up here i know we have got to <laughs> go a few minutes um beyond and let's shift here into safety security mm -hmm. i really want to bring this topic of safety and security because you know we see so many people and i done that myself chasing all these external things these methods like you were saying earlier we want to consume more because we think this thing that we're going to consume or if or we, if we pursue more money or the marriage or the relationship whatever is external we're pursuing with this false belief that if we have that thing, we're going to have more safety and security. You know, we're even looking this in therapy. If you give me the intellectual framework, if you can heal this in me, I'm going to have more safety and security. Let's talk truly yeah. what <laughs> safety and security is and how we obtain that yeah. through the inner work. And also what I keep thinking that nobody's going to like, but I'm going to say it anyway, say it. is, is that really what we need? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, we want to feel enough calm and peace yes. in our nervous system. We do. I also feel like there's a very low threshold in humanity right now for discomfort. 
So I just, yeah, that gives me goosebumps to say. So that's my intuition telling me it's important, right? It's like, yes, we all need some degree of safety and security to feel ease in our life. We do. I think that maybe in, again, depending on where we are, obviously the people who are listening to this are people who have a lot more safety and security than most people in the world. Yes. In a fundamental way. Right. So we're talking about that spiritual, psychological, emotional, right? We have a lot of safety and security in some of the most fundamental ways mm -hmm. and tolerating the discomfort, which I have struggled with a great deal in my life, which is, well, how much is, how much is okay? How much is normal? How much anxiety, depression, sadness, heartache can I feel? What's normal? Yeah. What's human? So I don't, I know that I'm kind of sidestepping a little bit of it, but I think it's really important because we need to learn. I think part of true security and safety is tolerating discomfort. Yeah. Tolerating pain, tolerating heartache, tolerating it. Like I know that I can serve, I'm going to survive this. And not only that, I'm going to have a better life knowing that I can feel this and I'm okay. Yeah. That's there's, it's like a journey. And when I'm on the other side of it, like when clients have said to me, I feel like I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. If I feel this feeling, I'm like, stay, 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 yeah. breathe, stay. I'm here. You're not alone. Stay. And you get to the other side of that. Mm -hmm. You will never feel the same degree of fear unsafety and insecurity ever again in the same way. Yep. And I know that sounds lofty, but it's one of the, it is it's true. That is, that is the moment. It's not, maybe it's not quantum, but it's like, don't, don't go away. Don't look for a show to watch, go on your phone, you know? Yeah. So like, I think a lot of the things that we equate with safety and security are actually things that are making us in a way feel less safe and less secure. Oh, way more. <laughs> That's why we talk so much more about safety and nervous system regulation. And in a way, we lost a lot of resilience as a culture. Exactly. The, 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 the way, like you're saying, like the, the ability to tolerate hard things, hard emotions. And I know this can you know, be an yeah. entire conversation because also a lot of people think resilience is to suck right. up and not no. allow your emotions to be exposed. So, of course... We're learning to balance, as we use this word, to balance really like resilience with as not just an ability to, you know, show up to your duty as a mother, as a mm -hmm. husband, as, as, as a, a citizen, but also have the resilience of sitting in your discomfort, sitting with your emotions instead of numbing yourself or distracting yourself right with tv with social media with alcohol and drugs and you know this yeah. leads to the whole pathway of addictions which we all have addictions we do just because we don't do drugs and drink you know mm. uh, we're alcoholics doesn't mean we don't have our addictions we do so just again have the awareness when you try to escape that state of sadness or, or anger or even anxiety and sit in that state exactly and be there Exactly. And also, and I would just say like part of humanity has always been community always. And we don't, that's a place where I think the resilience and sometimes like some of those, what you just talked about, I'm not telling people to sit and suffer in, by themselves. No, don't suffer alone. <laughs> you know, it's like, there's a place for being yes. able to like tolerate waves of challenges by ourselves. But I don't think that that's how we're built. I think we're built to be in relationship and to get secu security and safety by sharing our, our stories and by sharing what we feel and just having some people witness us, love us unconditionally, be present with us. And obviously that we're developing the ability to do that for ourselves. Mm -hmm. I agree. Community. <laughs> exactly. And with that said, I know a lot of people are having a hard time building communities. I have many clients feeling a lot of loneliness because they live with this belief that they cannot trust people. And if mm -hmm. you are somebody who has difficult 
with this, you don't trust people because you've been so hurt in your life, I would say, start your work from there. Exactly. Find a good coach, find a good therapist, reach out to us. Yeah, reach. And it start there. Like, you need to have the desire to heal this limiting belief that you cannot trust people. Exactly. And I find that is just creating a vicious cycle when we, they know, we know we heal in community, we heal in relationships, and yet, a lot of people are suffering alone. So the biggest message here, if that's you, don't suffer alone. Yes. Because you're not alone. Exactly. Ever. Ever. Mm -hmm. Alice, I think this is such a place for us to shift into our ending. So before I ask you my final questions, anything else that your heart wants to share? Yeah, I mean, I just, I would say it's just for that last piece that you just said, that every impulse in you might be telling you to keep doing what you're doing and isolate and it's really really a difficult place but it's like you know one of my teachers in grad school said you know disturb the homeostasis mm, i love that and so i would just that was one of those teachings that i knew would stay with me forever and i would just say when you are like wow i'm suffering look at what you're doing and look at the thing that actually feels like the scariest. Yeah. Like in a way we're saying to get to safety, you need to do the thing that feels the most scary and it's ironic. And that's something that I just, I know it for myself. It's like, find a way not to like, you know, blow yourself to smithereens in terms of like, Oh my God, this is too much, but reach. Yeah reach out literally like I was watching your hands when you were talking and it's like any way in the smallest way online you know say hello to somebody yeah. do the smallest action to disturb the homeostasis and to let the universe know that you're ready to mm -hmm. try yeah. something else yeah it's like you said in the beginning it's step into the unknown take that risk and go yeah. talk to a stranger go join a group mm -hmm reach out to us and if exactly. we can't help we're gonna at least point you to the right direction so there's always a place so my final question to you Allison that I ask all my new guests on rebranding God is if this was your last day on earth and you could leave humanity one message that you knew humanity would take what would that message be that you would want to leave in this planet Wow remember what you are mm. and it's just energy love and light and that's it yeah beautiful thank you so much where can yeah. people find you or your offerings are you taking new clients yes um they can look up allison Wellicky. yeah i'll put uh, your information on, online and send me a text email me call me call the phone number and just say, can we talk? <laughs> the old way. Exactly. Dial the I'm, all, I'm all about it lately. Just call me and I'll, I might even answer the phone and shock you. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Allison, this has been <laughs> so amazing. I look forward to round two. Yes. And I'm so happy to have you thank in my you. tribe and my <laughs> side and part of my community. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Many blessings. Mm.